Welcome to the Farm Bits podcast. Farm Bits is proudly produced by the Nebraska Digital Agriculture team and hosted by students at the University of Nebraska. The Farm Bits podcast comes to you each week to discuss the trends, the realities, and the value of digital agriculture. Through interviews with experts, producers, and innovators from across the agriculture industry, we hope that you step away from each episode with new practical knowledge of digital agriculture technology. Hello, Farm Bits followers, and welcome to another episode of the Farm Bits podcast. I'm Emily Hansen. And I'm Katie Bathke. This week, we are glad to have Dr. Derek Heron with us as we begin diving into the topic of irrigation management. Dr. Heron is an associate professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, who also conducts irrigation research for management strategies. Um, can you introduce yourself? What's your background? Where? Uh, what did you study? When did you start at UNL? And what are your roles here? All right. Yeah, good question. So uh, my name is Derek Heron, and I grew up in South Dakota, just north of here on a farm in the southeastern part of the state. And uh, with that background, always enjoyed uh, agriculture and had a passion for agriculture, uh, but also our natural resources and conserving our natural resources. So my path to this position probably started with choosing an undergraduate degree at South Dakota State University in agricultural engineering. Uh, I did a senior design project with a company called AgSense on sensors for center pivot automation, and that really uh, introduced me to irrigation. The, our family farm is rain-fed, but uh, that I had an opportunity to get exposed to it. Uh, after a couple of years in industry in the St. Louis area, I decided to do graduate school. So I did my master's at South Dakota State and then my PhD at Oklahoma State and came here in 2012. Awesome. So can you tell us now that you're at UNL and your official title is associate professor professor and irrigation engineer, on top of that, you have teaching and research appointments. What does that mean and what does that kind of look like in a day-to-day for you? Yeah, good question. So um, the irrigation engineer title basically reflects my area of technical expertise, and that's the expertise that I bring to the table in both research and teaching. Um, a typical day would include uh, on the teaching side, things like teaching a class, but also a lot of behind the scenes things. Um, I especially enjoy meeting with students, advising, mentoring, and then on the research side, a lot of time advising graduate students on their research projects, and then uh, pursuing different sources of funding, providing leadership to different research projects. Um, I name I know my day is going really well if those two areas overlap quite a bit, mm-hmm. and the, the research can inform what I share in the classroom, and the fundamentals that we cover in a class strengthen what I provide to a research project. Yeah. So what made you want to go into teaching and what's your favorite topic to teach? Uh, So I guess I've always been a teacher at heart and from a young age had a desire to be a teacher. Uh, In fact, for a long time, I envisioned myself being a pastor someday. And I think it was the teaching part of that that I was excited about. Uh, but I'm kind of a math geek. So at the end of the day, I ended up being a teacher in a college setting, uh, doing classes that combine our natural resources with agriculture, with numbers and equations. So uh, my favorite thing would be irrigation. And that's largely because that's where most of my expertise is in. So I feel like I have a lot to offer in a class on irrigation. I love that you mentioned your passion for teaching. I was raised by a teacher my whole life, so I have have (laughs) similar experiences as well. We're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about some of your irrigation research areas here at UNL. Can you give us like a brief introduction to maybe some projects of focus or what kind of long-term projects you've been on? Yeah, you bet. Um, So I'll list two particular projects that kind of serve as examples. Uh, One of them is a project we just funded on sensors for center pivots and specifically sensors mounted on a center pivot lateral. So in other words, a long pipeline that runs the length of the center pivot. Uh, That one was a partnership with Valmont Irrigation as well as USDA Agricultural Mm -hmm. Research Service. And we received funding from the Um, Irrigation Innovation Consortium, which supports these types of public-private partnerships. And that was exciting to uh, find out what data we get from sensors mounted on the pivot, and can we turn that into irrigation recommendations? The challenge with that is uh, if we 
measure soil moisture instead, it gives us a longer lead time to okay. predict when to irrigate so we can plan ahead and more easily avoid crop stress, where to pick up the signal in the crop canopy, uh, by the time there's a signal, there might already be some stress and yield loss. And so that's kind of what we were grappling with. Uh, we think we found a small window where you can detect the stress before the stress is enough to cause yield loss. Um, so we're excited to continue looking into that. Uh, second project I was going to mention, um, we've got uh, four students from Sudan here right now who are working on master's degrees. Uh, they all four work for irrigation industry in Sudan and are funded by industry to uh, learn more about our irrigation systems here in Nebraska and bring that expertise back. So um, one of the students is developing a project uh, really looking at drones and other sensor technology for irrigation and I'm excited because that project is very practically driven. Yeah. So, um, you know, what's current irrigation scheduling? What would be a small investment in sensors? What would be the really high tech? And then um, what are the economics of that range of options? And then um, when he goes back to Sudan, he'll be well equipped to make recommendations on which levels of technology to invest in. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so diving a little bit more into the sensors part of it, based on your research with sensors and irrigation management, can you explain the role that the sensors play in this type of research? Yeah, you bet. Um, so the sensors have taken off a lot, obviously, in the last decades, and I'm sure it probably shows up as a topic in many of your um, interviews. So from my perspective, uh, now we have lots of data, way more data than we know what to do with. And the challenge then is deciding what to do with it. So in an irrigation setting, uh, I mentioned the sensors for the crop canopy and the challenge of using that for irrigation. Um, so another option is uh, sensors for soil water, and those are not perfect either. They have uh, challenges with calibration and so on. And so part of my view as a whole is uh, we have lots of data streams, uh, online cloud data as well. Satellite data is becoming much more common, uh, lower cost uh, drone data. But how can we integrate those? So none of those data sources is a silver bullet for deciding when and how much to irrigate. Uh, but I think if we can integrate them in a way that minimizes our overall uncertainty, that's probably our best path forward. Neat. I like that, how you kind of mentioned that all these data sources can kind of come together and they're not all standalone exactly what you want. I think that's really important when it comes to digital agriculture. Um, so right now we're going to talk a little bit about, and I don't know how to say this, but your SETIM model. How do you say that? Yeah, we just call it set me. Set me model. Okay. So the question is, can you tell us a little about the set me model and how it helps with creating variable rate irrigation prescription maps? Yeah, you bet. So the set me model was developed by Dr. Christopher Neal, who is the uh, director of research at the Doherty Water for Food Global mm -hmm. Institute. And uh, when he first came to UNL, uh, we started talking and I said, we're wanting to develop a software for irrigation prescription maps. And he said, I have a software you can use. And anyway, it was one of those things where it, it made a really good collaboration. So uh, we had uh, some grad students initially do quite a bit of work on the model to adapt it to work for specifically for an irrigation setting. It was originally developed primarily for ET, but it had a spatial component. Um, so that model primarily runs a soil water balance. So it's taking advantage of that concept of how soil water gives us lead time and foreseeing when we need to irrigate. Um, it takes advantage of imagery, either from a satellite or more recently we've used drone imagery as well mm -hmm. uh, to update the model. Uh, the best way that it does that, it uses uh, multispectral uh, imagery uh -huh. to get uh, the vegetation index. So kind of like NDVI, we use SAVI, S-A-V-I. Yeah. Um, and then based on that index, it tells us about the ET, how much evapotranspiration or crop water use there is. So if there's part of the field that's really lush and growing rapidly, mm -hmm. it'll pick up on that. If there's part that's developing more slowly, maybe there's a low area that you know partially drowned out, um, it'll account for that as well. Um, one other high tech part of this model is it can use thermal imagery, uh, which is really good at detecting stress. And so if the soil water has less water than what we think, 
and therefore the crop is under stress, and so the crop water use, the ET is low, then that thermal image will pick up on that. And so we can update our soil water level accordingly. Yeah, it seems like spatial variability is a big role in all of that. So when looking at your publications, can you speak about that role that spatial variability has in your research projects and how it intersects with irrigation systems? Yeah, you bet. Um, so the, you know, to tie it in with SEPMI, the spatial variability um, shows up then in our output. We can output a prescription map for a variable rate irrigation system. So if you have different soil types in the field, uh, we can account for that and provide different amounts of water. Um, and actually, I, I have a background in soil variability more from an environmental perspective from my PhD. So it's been fun to bring that expertise in. Um, one of the questions from a precision ag perspective is, uh, what are the things that do vary spatially? When is it significant? And when is it interesting, but not big enough to be a big deal? Mm -hmm. And then what are the economics, right? And so one of the things that we've learned with the variable rate irrigation on the soils part of it for um, our soils that are typical in Nebraska with corn and soybean, the amount of water that we can reduce pumping for irrigation is fairly small and it'd be hard to pay for a zone control irrigation system. Uh, speed control, for sure. Those um, are very low cost, sometimes come available with a standard pivot now. Um, but for that high-end zone control, I think it's more likely to be able to pay for it in a scenario where you can use that spatial irrigation to improve your yields. Another area that I'm excited about is combining spatial irrigation management with spatial fertilizer, yeah. fertigation in particular. Okay. And I think that will be another thing that will has potential to improve yields as a way to um, help justify the investment in some of this technology. I love that you kind of mentioned, especially when you talk about precision ag, is how economical can these things be and how, like, how impactful is it? Because yes, it is going to vary, but like, to what does that make a difference? So I, I really like that comment. Um, so it's very easy to see through this interview how what your research is doing is driven for the public sector and how that is supposed to connect and kind of kind of elevate that. So can you tell us a little bit about kind of what you believe your role is in the public sector, particularly since you are on the academia side, as well as kind of developing precision ag technologies and preparing farmers for transition to using these technologies in their operations? Yeah, um, good question. So yeah, that the connection with the public is really important to me, especially as a land grant university. Um, you know, we're largely paid by tax dollars uh, to do things that benefit the taxpayers. And so um, you know, my hope is that our research really benefits people in real life, makes a practical difference, and that's what we strive towards. In terms of the public-private partnership connection uh, and how uh, we interface with industry, um, I think it, in irrigation, it would be silly for us to not partner with industry. Um, the industry is doing lots of really great things on, you know, sensors, data integration, um, remote uh, monitoring and control, uh, decision support. Um, and so, you know, it, it, we wouldn't get very far by ourselves. <laughs> but on the other hand, I think there's things that the university can bring to the table, especially a depth of expertise, you know, from the classroom and from, um, you know, highly detailed research, you know, experiments. And so I, I think the most exciting things are when those two come together, when we bring together um, the development that industry is doing. We can test those products, quantify the benefits, but then also provide some scientific insights that help strengthen those products as they are developed. Yeah. So as more of that research and all the projects become more available to the public, um, as a researcher, what do you see about the adoption of precision irrigation tech and where do you see this trend going in the future? Yeah, in terms of adoption rates, um, I think, well, I'll start off by saying that Nebraska has some of the highest adoption rates in the country for irrigation. So we're always excited about that with uh, you know, soil water sensors and so on uh, and look forward to those continuing to improve. I think... Um, you know, sensors for irrigation management is probably where we'll see the most growth in adoption, um, whether it's, you know, conventional irrigation or 
the speed control that we mentioned earlier. Um, the you know, industry is making soil water sensor data, for example, uh, easier to access from the cloud, easier to incorporate into the decision making. Um, I think things like that will continue to improve adoption rates. Um, you know, as we learn for soil water sensors, for example, um, getting the exact volumetric water content from a soil water sensor is very hard, but the trends are usually pretty good. And so um, figuring out how to, can we do our irrigation scheduling simply based on the trends? Uh, so anyway, as we work through some of that, I think that will increase adoption rates. In terms of precision irrigation in particular with the variable rate, with individual sprinkler control, um, I think well, it's really useful for us as researchers because we can take a circular center pivot and make rectangular plots for our research. Uh, but beyond that, agronomically, I think it, it'd be, adoption rates would be higher in places like New Zealand where they're required okay. to account for all of their water and nitrate spatially mm -hmm. uh, or places like California where you have really high dollar vegetable crops where small differences can make a big difference in yield. Um, or someday here, perhaps as that fertigation gets better woven into the technology. Awesome. Yeah. Can we go into a little bit of like, what do you see as challenges or possibly even weaknesses in this area of research right now? And kind of maybe how in the future we're aiming to kind of lessen those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, the biggest challenge, as I see it anyway, from my vantage point, for irrigation is this data integration piece right now. I think um, there are, you know, the signal to noise ratio, if we bring in all the different data together, there's a lot of signal there to make really good decisions, but how to bring it together is the hard part. Um, we have some new technologies now that were much less available when I started 10 years ago, um, especially computationally, like machine learning. And so, um, it can do amazing things mathematically, but there's always some concern about, well, is it just a black box? If it's a black box, does it translate to a different field and a different crop? And so um, personally, I think having a combination of more physically based models and mm -hmm. the machine learning is probably the best path forward, uh, but we're a ways from doing that well. Um, one thing I thought of just a couple nights ago, I took a picture with my new phone at dusk and uh, the phone recognized that it was dusk and automatically changed settings to yeah. a three second shutter. I didn't know it could do that. Um, but after three seconds, it made a fantastic picture. And so sometimes our phones recognize the problem before we do, right? And can propose a solution for us. And obviously Apple has a pretty big budget. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I guess I envision someday us getting to that point with irrigation apps and irrigation interfaces mm -hmm. where, you know, there's all this data coming in, a producer doesn't know where it all comes from and that's okay. They don't have to, but the, the, the system is combining that data, making recommendations, a producer approves or declines the recommendations. And then over time you track how it's impacting your production and economics. I think, I think you'll appreciate like what you just said, because I just interviewed another company this morning and that was basically how they were really implementing the integration of all their data was into one app. And so I think that's just like really interesting because um, I don't have an irrigation background. So it's it's cool to see that like you can hold it all in your hand, especially with that many data sources coming together as one. So I think in those areas, you wouldn't think it elevates research, but it really does at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I guess from like a producer standpoint, it makes it a whole lot simpler if you yeah. can see everything all at once versus having to go to 10 different websites or 10 different apps to try and get all of the data to make a decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So I guess what we kind of want to know now as a researcher in this field, a lot of researchers are always thinking ahead. And so what is something that like really excites you around this technology around irrigation management and kind of how that's fitting into the future? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I guess I mentioned earlier, I'm a teacher at heart. Yeah. And so um, it's a little different than the research strain, but I'm excited about the opportunity to do more irrigation education. Okay. Um, and that obviously good education depends on lots of good research. So we're providing good training. Um, I read recently 
uh, well, the irrigation industry did a survey and sort of a needs assessment of the irrigation industry. And they said, um, you know, we just can't uh, sell irrigation systems fast enough or hire enough people. So mm -hmm. anyway, there's a lot of growth right now, a mm -hmm. lot of need for people who are educated and trained in irrigation systems. Mm -hmm. I think UNL is an exciting place to do that. Um, both our undergraduate programs as well as um, graduate programs. I mentioned students from Sudan earlier. I think that's pretty neat. Um, I'm excited about the two undergraduate programs I work most closely with are agricultural engineering and uh, mechanized systems management. We're renaming that one to agricultural systems technology. Uh, I'm excited about that. Um, as part of that renaming process, we're reviewing our curriculum and looking for places to bring in additional technology into that curriculum to really provide our students the best uh, training possible for these career paths in the precision ag sector. Awesome. So I know this question is not on the paper, but I am curious is how do you feel that the education and the research plays into the future of sustainability for water resources? If you could just give a little light on that. Yeah, oh, that's kind of deep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the, the research uh, or research and extension, you know, basically better understanding the science and technology development to provide solutions and getting that out there. Extension plays a big role. Um, and I view uh, my work with extension, even though I don't formally have an extension mm -hmm. appointment, but working with industry as much as producers uh, as a way to learn from industry and producers, as well as share what we're learning with them. Um, for example, uh, our variable rate system is from Lindsay, and we've been uh, working with them for several years, been a really, you know, a win-win type of working relationship. Um, in terms of the education, I think that helps with future adoption rates, basically. Uh, so if future generations better understand um, our water resources, the importance of sustainability, and then some practical ideas of how to implement that, that's really valuable. Um, Another faculty in our department is uh, Aaron Middlestead, and just yesterday he showed me a small um, groundwater model, a physical model that you can bring into the classroom, and uh, it's got sand or gravel. You can choose which type you want for your aquifer. You can make it so there's a stream and the aquifer next to it, and you use a straw to simulate a pump with drawing the water resources. You can put in food coloring, uh, but just a fantastic uh, teaching tool for helping students better appreciate the water resources concepts. I love that. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so where can our listeners go to learn more about what you have for research? Yeah, good question. Uh, the first place to start would be our website, which is heron.unl.edu. Uh, so that's H-E-E-R-E-N.unl.edu. And uh, we've got several different web pages uh, as part of that site, uh, basically on the different themes of our research. So one is on uh, sensors for irrigation technology. One is on uh, some of the practical aspects of sprinkler systems. Um, anyway, uh, so take a look at that. And I'd also mention we've published a textbook recently mm -hmm. on irrigation systems management. So if you Google irrigation systems management, it'll come right up. It's free. Um, and, you know, as a textbook, it's more focused on the fundamentals than the latest high tech, uh, but I think also some good resources in there. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, lastly, on Farm Bits, we have a tradition of where we like to ask our guests some words of wisdom or a piece of advice for people starting or wanting to work in the irrigation field. Do you have any tips or suggestions for skills that would be important to develop during their degree program or even on their own operation? Yeah. So I always get excited when students ask that question or when we're recruiting students and giving unsolicited advice. But one of the <laughs> uh, best advice I can give is to pursue experiences that align with interest. And so for incoming students um, who have an interest in irrigation or are unsure if they are interested in that or not, um, I would encourage them to look for ways to get experiences. Uh, faculty usually hire students to help with research projects, great way to get exposed, uh, industry internships, uh, getting involved with student clubs and getting to know the older students who already have uh, careers lined up, um, networking. But 
those experiences are just such a great way to find out what you like, to yeah. identify those skills, to develop them. Uh, the other thing I would say is uh, be strategic when you're picking classes. So um, if you want to take an irrigation class and it's a senior level class, if you're excited about it, take it as early as possible. Your junior year, um, the, the sooner the better to identify that interest and use it when you go out on an internship. So Awesome. Well, that's kind of, is there anything that we didn't ask you that you would like to talk about? Any projects or? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I have anything in particular to add. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. I just mentioned again, the Water for Food Global Institute. Uh, they've been a big supporter of both the research yes. and the education we do. And I think uh, making a lot of impact in this space. So. I would absolutely agree with that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much to Dr. Derek Heron for taking the time to join us on this episode of the Farm Bits podcast. It's really exciting to hear the firsthand experience and the behind the scenes of the irrigation research going on at UNL. My favorite part of this interview was the role that sensors play in irrigation management. I would have to agree. The science behind the technology was very interesting, but I loved Dr. Heron's emphasis for teaching the future irrigation managers. I hope you enjoyed this episode and we look forward to sharing another digital egg story with you next week on Farm Bits. Thank you for taking the time to join us today on the Farm Bits podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts to be informed about the latest content each week. We welcome your feedback, so if you have comments or questions for us, please reach out to us over email, on Twitter, or in the review sections of your favorite podcast platforms. Our contact information can be found in the show notes. We would like to thank Nebraska Extension for their support of this podcast and their commitment to providing high-quality informational material to members of the agricultural community in Nebraska and beyond. The opinions expressed by the hosts and guests on this podcast are solely their own and do not reflect the views of Nebraska Extension or the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. We look forward to you joining us next week for another episode of Farm Bits.